Hi, Alistair. I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Hi, uh, How are you doing today? Okay. I'm very good. That's some lovely wallpaper you have. Thank you. Lots going on. <laughs> yes. Very, very House of Hackney. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. Oh, it is. Okay, there we go. Very <laughs> nice. I love that you know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's inside knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, cool. Thank you for taking the time to interview me today. No problem. So, I mean, it's actually, um, to introduce it a bit, the documentary is already shown, hasn't it, for the first time, I think, on BBC, available on BBC iPlayer, but it's going to be screening again. Maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction. Um, what can yeah. people expect if they watch it? So, Legends Never Die, the story of Juice World XX Tantacion, Little Peep, is uh, a feature documentary by the BBC about... Um, three young music artists who turned the music industry upside down and then all tragically died by the time they were 21. And this film, I think, explore, this film explores the, these, these artists' legacy a little bit and then also asks the questions, you know, why did this tragedy happen? And, and what was your way in to this story? Was it through, um, you know, being a fan of, uh, the, of the music, you know, being involved in the music industry. Um, yeah. and, and why did you decide this would be, a, you know, a really fascinating topic for a documentary? So, so straight off the bat, I am a big music fan, um, for sure. And I knew, I knew of these artists because you can't not, not know these artists, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know their back catalogue. I didn't know that much about them, their personal lives, their story. So, you know, in this documentary, you know, obviously we, we had to research their music and their, you know, their, their story. And I got to learn a lot more about them. Um, I think, you know, these artists, you know, their, their impact is unquestionable. You know, if you look at Little Peep, Juice World, and XX Tentacion, you know, they're some of the most streamed artists in the world today on Spotify now. And I think that's, that's, that is some achievement. Um, I don't think the film is a biopic on each of the artists because the film, you know, it's a 50 minute film. So this film isn't, this film will not give you the definitive story of Juice World. This film will not give you the definitive story of XX Tentacion. What this film does do is, you know, I think for an audience, let these, you know, tell these, to tell an audience who these artists are um, what their what their music was, what their music sounded like, and then you know ask the question, which is really what the kernel and thesis of the film is: is why did these artists die um, so young? And I think what we the the two themes that sort of came to the front were instant fame and social media, mm. and how what is the impact these two things can have as a young person. I mean. I felt very old watching it because it made me realize that, you know, I'm 36. So in terms of my social media use, I'm in a slightly different, you know, uh, era in comparison, probably to people who are, you know, hardcore fans of this music and just all this content and how um, people who are thrown into the spotlight almost live their entire lives, you know, um, through a phone screen. Um, and that's kind of extraordinary and mind blowing and you see, how amazing it is that sort of regular people in a way can find their find an audience without the middleman you know of needing big kind of music um contracts and, and and things like this but it's also terrifying because you think well not there's not a moment really that they're living that's not with an audience so you know um what do you think that kind of has to say about where we are in terms of our use of social media and and, and the music industry <laughs> Well, I think, you know, social media is a very powerful tool. I think social media, you know, can, can be a good thing because as you see, you can upload your song, you can reach a wide audience, which is, you know, which is fantastic just with a few clicks of a button. You can, you can, you can build your fan base on social media. And for someone with limited, no resources, that's amazing. You don't need a record contract, but there is another side to social media. And I think, you know, DJ Scheme, in the documentary says, you know, there's one side to social media, which is amazing. And there's another side where you have to give that piece of you 
what makes you 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 and you you give it you know you have to you have to give it a, you have to give it away to your you know to 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 your audience to your social media audience so i think i think it can be a powerful tool but i think it can obviously have a you know damaging impact um on someone um and especially if someone's especially if someone has demons or is, is, is going through their own, you know, mental health battle, you know, you know, social media is, can be, you know, can definitely have a, a, a damaging impact for sure. When you look at all three of these artists, all three of these artists were going through their own struggles, whether that's addiction, whether that's mental health and, you know, social media clearly had an impact, you know, on, on all these and all these issues that each artist were facing um, you know the music in the music industry um, is is you know rightly so you know running to sign these artists because they're clearly very talented and you know they're happy to happy to you know write a big check for these artists and sign these artists and you know I, I applaud you know I applaud them for getting record contracts and working with these artists because I think you know I think I think they're very talented but I'd like to know more about what they're doing to look after young artists who especially become you know young artists who are becoming superstars over overnight as well yeah. and um you know what what can be done to ensure future um you know fu future artists uh, are looked after as yeah. well because you know it's not just these three artists you know there's an artist last year called Pop Smoke, who tragically died. And he had one of the most streamed albums of last year. And he was also just 21. Yeah. There's also, you know, Mac Miller, who died, who was, he's a bit older, he was 26. But these are all young men, all young people, all with so much talent. And they're all tragically dying. And whether that's from drugs or different circumstances, but, you know, these, these young artists are, are dying so young. And I feel the you know i think everyone has a responsibility from the music industry to fans to social media you know we should all be supporting these artists mm. there's a really interesting line i'm sorry i can't recall exactly which of your interviewees says it but um that it's almost the way they they kind of broke new ground and connected with their audiences was by being very vulnerable and very authentic and very open um, about their struggles, which I guess was kind of a new concept. It's, you know, in hip hop, particularly men talking about their feelings. So it felt, felt in that sense, it could be seen as quite progressive. But uh, again, as the interview goes on to say, at what cost? So it's almost the, the, the very thing that helped them become so successful was also the source of their downfall. So do you think there's a real double-edged sword to this kind of new, I think at some point they call it emo rap um, kind of genre, if you like? But, you know, I think any successful or any good artist, whether that's a hit in hip hop, pop, rock and roll, I think you have to you, you have to be honest and open. You have, you, your work has to come from somewhere, right? And so if that is showing a vulnerability or talking about a vulnerability, you, you, you know, I think that's, I think, I think that's, that's part and parcel of being, you know, a, a, a true, a true artist. You have to give a piece of you to your audience. I think the difference is nowadays, it's not just about giving a piece of you to your audience in a song, you also uh, have to give a piece of yourself, when it, whether that's in social media or anything else you're doing that connects to finding an audience. You know, I think there's a sociologist we interviewed, Doc, um, Calvin, um, Dr. Calvin Smiley, who says, you know, you have your front stage and then your backstage and that line now is blurred. So there's no, you know there is no backstage with social media now so you know nowadays you you have to you you know you, you have to be a 24 7 entertainer which is what Tariq who's a music entrepreneur and rolling loud uh, co-ceo and co-founder you have to be on 24 7 mm. so that must have that must have a lasting impact and a, and a, and a damaging impact I mean, yeah, I think when he puts it like that, you know, that after you've done your gig, 
you can't just then go home you're still and suddenly something that obviously a lot of people aspire to everybody wants to be a rock star everybody wants to be famous and be on that stage have the adoring fans but the idea that you can't go home suddenly sounds like a terrifying nightmare that you wouldn't be able to leave and you kind of wonder is that where this is headed <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think I think that's a really that's a that's a really good point you make. I think that you know, you think of it as a glamorous lifestyle, but you could all you know. I think I think there's there's that you could also look at it in a way as you say that it's a unrelenting, almost suffocating world you're living in where you have to be on. You have to have to be performing twenty twenty four seven. And that's a very, it's a very dangerous world to live in. Um, I watched a couple of weeks ago, the um, Star is Born, not the new one with Bradley Cooper, but mm. the old one with Barbara Streisand. Mm. And you're looking at rock and roll and being a rock and roll star back in the 70s. Mm. And it's a very, it's almost, a it's almost a romantic way of looking at what it means to be a rock and roll music star back then, because you play your show mm. and then you go back to your your mansion mm -hmm. and and nowadays i don't think you can i don't think you can do that i think you have to you have to be performing 24 7 and that you know i think from that there there has to be consequences mm. and maybe you can tell us a bit about kind of the logistics of putting it together you know because um, I believe, you know, you weren't working with like a very big budget. How did you go about kind of contacting all your interviewees? And I know you're working with yeah. kind of a small team and some, you know, one who has encyclopedic knowledge of this whole scene, which you would have to, even to have like gone through all of that footage and piece it all together. And then of course the graphics that you've added in, which kind of, yeah. you know, bring, hold everything together. Well, you know, this, this film is made by BBC Studios. And the great thing is when you make a film for the BBC, you know, we made this with the documentary unit, which are the incredible group of filmmakers and storytellers. But, you know, when you make a film for the BBC, you also have the support of the legal department, the music department, the, uh, you know, press, all, all of these things. So there's a real support system there to try and make the best possible film. Um, so that's, that's heartening to know that you've got the, the infrastructure there. The budget wasn't big. Um, and also there was COVID and I think the plan was to go out to America to film. We didn't, we actually did the interviews um, with a remote setup over Zoom, which um, like a camera crew, like we're talking now, but they've put, plugged the camera feed into Zoom mm -hmm. and they've put my face on an Interatron, which basically projects my image um, to the interviewee and we can just be doing the interview like this. So that actually meant we could go to a few more cities and meet a few more people and interview a few more people. So rather than that being, um, that was, you know, I feel like that was, that was definitely a positive thing. This is an epic story. I think it has everything in it. I think there's tragedy. I think there's, you know, incredible, you know, incredible characters in, you know, in this, in the, in the story for an audience to, to grapple with. But whenever you make a documentary, you can have an incredible story, but you need, you need someone to tell that story. And so, you know, obviously you need to, you need to, you need to cast contributors. You need to, you need to get access to these people. Um, and access to contributors and securing interviews is, it's definitely how to describe it. I feel you have to, number one, you have to be patient. And number two, you need time. And if you have those two things, then you, you can get the right result. I think we were very fortunate through, you know, persistence and time. We managed to get, you know, interviews with Juice Wells and XX Tantacion's best friend, Ski Master Slump God. Mm -hmm. Likewise with Little Peep, uh, we interviewed his best friend, Young Goff, you know, the you know and that was that was incredible and I really feel that their contribution uh, really really helps tell the you know the, the story in the film and you know we're, we were very fortunate we were very fortunate there um, but like I said patience is and time is what you need mm -hmm. and if you don't have one of those things 
it can be um, can be a little tricky and difficult, especially when you're working with rock and roll stars. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, getting uh, getting the interviews once, and we kind of knew that we had good interviews um, once we had filmed them. Um, but again, you know, half the battle is just getting that interview. You know, yeah. because a lot of the time when you watch a music documentary or even any documentary, if the quality of the interview an interviewee is not up to scratch or is not a relevant person I feel that that story loses credibility mm -hmm. so you know the people we wanted to interview they really needed to be uh, invested in the scene they needed to be part of the scene they needed to understand the scene and they really needed to have something to say mm -hmm. and I feel that all the seven people we interviewed in this documentary definitely had something to say mm -hmm. and that was super important and in a way as a director that makes your job easy because you just have to click record. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's more than that, but there was a willingness from all of our contributors to share something. And for that, I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. Regards to the graphics, the graphics did play an important part in this documentary. You know, um, it's a very visual world, the SoundCloud rap world. And so straight from the get-go, graphics were really important. And again, you know, there's there's so many different ways to do graphics nowadays. You could go to a post house in Soho and get them to start working with graphics and, you know, you can mock title up, but, but, you know, really you want a graph, you want a graphic designer who understands the scene and is also incredibly talented and also who can't, who won't just sort of work in a, we wanted a graphic designer who would be able to work throughout the whole process of the film. So I actually, um, I actually got, I was very fortunate. I was connected with a very young, talented graphic designer called Alice, who, um, Alice the Ink, who is, um, is, is a lovely person. She's a huge music fan. And she actually helped design some of the James Bond titles. Mm. You know, played as James Bond. And she was looking to do more projects which she had a personal interest in. Mm. And when I pitched her this music documentary, she would she she absolutely jumped at the chance to work at it. And I really feel her contribution to the film really elevates the film and helps tell tell the story. And she was she was involved from the get-go from pre-production right up until us delivering the final edit. Mm. So she's designing whether that's animating lyrics, whether that's animating social media, whether that's animating tweets. You know, she was she was invested and involved every step of the way. So I'm forever grateful for her involvement. And, um, you know, she's a very talented young graphic designer. I think she's under 25. Mm. And so she's really, you know, she's really doing incredible things. And um, she was definitely, again, another component that was essential to making and delivering the best possible film. Mm. And of course, you know, these stories aren't free of controversy. And in fact, kind of, um, you know, embracing or leaning into controversy uh, was kind of part of the way a lot of these artists did find their, their, their footing or, you know, managed to explode kind of their fan base. Um, but even I think, you know, hasn't there been some controversy about the way some of the, the stories that you've, you've told in the film? Um, and, and what the balance of, you know, the positive things and the negative things are. So how did you decide what that balance was? And well, did you, were you kind of bracing yourself that there would be some kind of reaction, however you pitched it? I, I don't claim to say we've made the definitive film on Little Peep, Juice World, or XX Tentacion. You yeah. know, this, it, this is a 50 minute film. Um, and so we're somewhat limited to what components of each of their stories we can tell. I feel what we wanted to focus on is we wanted to introduce these artists, their sound, and a little bit about, I don't know, where they came from and what they had to say. And then, um, you know, really, I think the, the thesis of the film and what emerged on the common thread was we wanted to focus on that idea of instant fame and social media and what impact that has. And so that's what we really focused on and I feel that is what you know what the film does I feel is ask you know it, it wants the audience to ask um, 
ask questions of, you know, what the, you know, are these art, you know, were these artists victims? Because you mm. could, you know, you could, you could look at it in, you know, in that way, they were victims of social media, they were victims of their lifestyle, they were victims of circumstance. And so I think it's important that, um, I think audiences understand that this isn't the definitive film, you know, because we, we couldn't fit everything into it. We couldn't fit everything into this film and it wouldn't, you know, each artist, their lives are so epic and sprawling, even in their young age of 21, you could do a three part episode on each of these artists mm. and you know, a three, a three part, a three episode series on each of these artists. And I actually think that, you know, that there should be, um, HBO released a Juice World documentary in uh, just before Christmas, which I saw, which was very interesting. And I know uh, there's an XX Tentacion feature documentary that is premiering at South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. And Little Peep had a feature documentary, um, which is out on Netflix, which is worth watching. So, you know, I hope that this film is just one part of the mm. conversation. It's not the, you know, it's not, it's not the, you know, it's not meant to be the definitive take on these artists' lives. Mm. And, but at the same time, would you say as well that, you know, as a documentarian, you can't shy away from the negative aspects. And so, you know, you had to kind of also do justice to, you know, uh, you know, the fact that it came out that Excess Tentacion did have these um, you know, issues or charges against mm. him of being uh, an abuser and things like that. So, you, you know, you can't just do kind of a rose-tinted rose glasses view on things either. So these things do need to be mentioned, but of course, there's always going to be different balances that you can strike. It, no, it, exactly that. I feel as, you know, as an audience, when you want to know, or, or, you know, or when you watch these, 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 let me start again. As an audience, when you watch these these artist story unfold, I think everything is open to interpretation, mm -hmm. and you know you can make you can you know you can make up your own mind about these artists. And you know, as I said, this film is only one part of a wider conversation. Regards XX and what he did allegedly, and what he you know what he is you know what he has been charged with. You can, you know, as an audience, you can then read up on that, do your own research, mm. and you know, all of that. And XX, you know, he's he is for, you know, for for many for many for for many people, he is he is God. He is, you know, he has a huge diehard loyal, you know, loyal fan following. And I, you know, I respect I respect all his fans, and I feel that, you know, this film is just one one part of of a wider of a wider conversation mm -hmm. and if it gets people talking um about his legacy and what he has done if it gets people talking about mental health if it gets people talking about the impact of social media i think that's all all all, all we can really ask for um with the film mm -hmm. and yeah so i guess <clears throat> just to finish because i've got over my time but um you know what I guess you've mentioned a few things there. What do you hope people will take away? Because I found it impossible not to be moved. I mean, even just the kind of eeriness of, um, you know, those lyrics, you know, about it being the, the 21 club, not the 26 club, 27, sorry. Um, you know, there's just something crazy about the whole thing and it feels like something needs to change. It's, you know, it's, it's very tragic. You know, you've got three talented young men who have all died before the age of 21. That's, that is a tragedy. Um, and I guess, you know, it's, I think what I want the audience to think about is, you know, how are we looking after, mm -hmm. you know, the younger generation coming through, Gen Z? What, what is the music industry doing? What are we doing as social media users? You know, does it have to be, an echo chamber of social media, you know, how, uh, you know, how can we support, you know, young artists coming up when they do sign a record deal? What, you know, what are we, what are we doing to, you know, help them navigate the many hurdles, the tours, the press, the responsibility, you know, everything there. And, you know, also these young artists, that's, you know, they're signing record contracts when they're 18, 19 years old, you know, young, young people who any mistake, they do, you know, do make gets magnified 
100 times just both because of the position they're in and it's really important that i feel we need to you know music is very different the music scene being a rock and roll star today and i don't think you're a rock and roll star today because kind of rock and roll isn't what it used to be the you know there's there's no there's no led zeppelin of today now and you know, I would say that the most popular genre and the most streamed form of music is hip hop today. Mm. And um, these three hip hop artists, or I, you could argue on the on the definition of hip hop with all of them, but these three artists who had um, a hip hop leaning, they were um, they were all very very talented, and their body of work is diverse. And I feel. I feel it's just a, you know, it's just a tragedy that they did die so young. And I feel, you know, what I want the an audience to to have when, you know, when they watch this is, you know, what can we what can we be doing for future generations? And I hope, you know, above all else, you know, I think, and I'm I'm very I feel very privileged to have interviewed so many people close to these artists. You know, I feel that there's there's emotion in the in the film with you know, the, the, the tragic circumstances of each of their deaths, which, which were tragic. And, mm. you know, you know, just on a, on a basic storytelling level, it, you know, it's a, you know, it's a tragedy what happened. And I will hope that the audience responds, responds in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with no, us. Have you already got your next cool. project project? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I, I do want to do another music project. Yeah. I would like that very much. I'm actually, um, doing um uh, doing a project with the invictus games coming up um which is also i think a, a different kind of emotional weight um to that but i would love to um oops, sorry I'll just decline that um i would love to um i i would love to do another music project but i'm not quite sure what the uh who the well i have a couple of ideas of artists but i'm not quite sure which artist it will be yet. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I would, uh, for me, music documentaries can be, can be epic and, you know, and incredible. And one of, um, actually, I watched it the other day. There's a David Bowie documentary that was on BBC iPlayer that I've seen quite a few times. And I re, I re watched it recently. And for me, you know, David Bowie is one of the most talented artists and, you know, to, of, any of any generation and I feel you know who's who's the David Bowie of this generation and I'd mm -hmm. like to I would like to make a documentary on, on that person mm -hmm. amazing well thank you so much for speaking to us and I can't wait for everyone else to see this uh, you know incredible documentary and uh, thank you it's 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 airing on BBC three again mm -hmm. this Thursday and then it's going to be on iPlayer I think for the rest of the year which is fantastic and that's yeah. the great thing about the BBC is we've managed to clear all this archive and music so it's you know it's it's sitting on iPlayer um, mm -hmm. for a year for audiences to enjoy which is fantastic. Amazing. Um,